So our keynote speaker today is Nancy Warren. And Nancy, as a child growing up in New York City, she questioned why the fish she caught smelled like gasoline. Why her eyes burned and why barges of trash were being dumped into the ocean. The adults around her had no answers and thus began her lifetime of environmental activism. Throughout more than 45 years living in Michigan, Nancy has tackled many issues, from joining wetland preservation committees working with land developers, to challenging the Department of Corrections with their prison site selection, to fighting to preserve wild spaces. Nancy has been at the forefront working to find common ground. She traveled to Washington, D.C. to lobby for a land and water conservation fund and expose the power company to violating the terms of their license agreement. And her passion for wolves began more than 20 years ago when she learned that there were a handful of wolves in Michigan's Upper Peninsula and sought to improve human tolerance through education, kind of like what we're trying to do today. She is an active volunteer for the Speakers for Bureau excuse me, of Timber Wolf Alliance, giving programs at schools and various organizations throughout northern Wisconsin and the Upper UP, Western UP, excuse me. She serves as the executive director of the National Wolf Watcher Coalition, held a seat on the Michigan Wolf Stakeholders Committee, and was a representative on the Michigan DNR Wolf Roundtable, charged with developing and guiding principles uh, for sorry, the, the wolf, uh, Michigan Wolf Management Plan. For 19 seasons, Nancy was a volunteer carnivore tracker for the Wisconsin Volunteer Carni uh, Carnivore Program, assisting with wolf population monitoring through tracking and howling surveys. That sounds fun, doesn't it? You're going to listen to them howl. She's been on many uh, volunteer boards, coalitions. Uh, right now, she and her husband, Al, live up in the Western UP and have welcomed and adapted to having wolves and other wild animals frequent their property, which, have been placed, which has been placed under con a conservation easement, ensuring its protection for future generations. So please help me in welcoming Nancy Warren. Um, and I entered high school during the environmental movement of the 60s. 
And I learned very early on that decisions concerning the environment are politically motivated and not, for the most part, based on science. And I helped organize events at my high school for the first Earth Day. And I thought, but every day should be Earth Day. Um, so today I'm going to just talk a little bit about how I became involved and what just a few projects that I became involved in. And one of them was prison, and one of them was snowmobiling, and another is land, and fourth, wolves. Um, and all of these do have a few things in common. And when you're fighting environmental issues, number one, you need to research the issue. You need to share those facts. You have to have public engagement. Without public engagement, you're lost. Um, and you can never give up. You've got to dream big. And when everything they throw at you, you just have to bounce back up. And um, I've been asked many times, well, how do you keep on going? And I said, well, I've learned that when the train is coming, you just lay down on the tracks. Let the train go by and you bounce back up and you put a smile on your face because then it makes them think what you're up to. You know, <laughs> why are you smiling? You're up to something. And that's the, what I want to leave with. So one of the first big projects I got involved in was the Department of Corrections. We lived in Holly. Um, during a time when the majority of prisons were being built in Michigan in small towns. And just in the period between 1980 and 2012, uh, 2002, 350 new prisons were built in rural counties. And we got word that there was going to be a prison proposed for Holly, Michigan. And the first thing was criteria. Oh, it's the distance to the court, you know, for the prisoners to go to court. Holly didn't meet that. We were more than 30 miles away from the court in Oakland County. And then they said distance to state police post. We didn't meet that. So the way they corrected that was they put a little substation in the town of Holly. Um, it was a man. Um, if you needed a cop, you had to go up to the button and press a little red button and it went to Pontiac and they sent somebody. But that met the criteria as far as they were concerned to having a state police post. And then they said, the cost of the land is another criteria. Um, and again, you have to dig through and peel back all the layers to find the criteria. Well, we found out the Pontiac, they could rent the land for a dollar a year for 100 years, um, as opposed to paying the fair market value for this land in Holly, um, which was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for the land. Uh, so we didn't meet that criteria. But the other criteria was public support. And we thought, OK, we can nail them on this one. Um, so we go to the township, and we find out that the township already supported this. They never paid attention to how much the cost of services were going to be to bring a prison to a rural area. Um, they led people to believe it was a done deal. I went to several township meetings, and well, this is where it's going. And we even had the Department of Corrections tell us the gorilla is going to sit where the gorilla is going to sit. And, you know, when you're sitting in a group, you know, 100 people, 150 people, we all kind of march out going, well, it's a done deal. The gorilla is going to sit there. And I said, no, it's not going to sit here. So we demanded, you know, look. Politely, we asked for, but we demanded. We weren't going to give up. We said, let's do an environmental assessment on this area where you want to put the plant. Well, they didn't want to do that. Let's have a plant and wetland evaluation. They didn't want to do that. So we called in the Audubon Society. We called in a few other groups and said, hey, they're not going to do it. Can you do it? And yeah, they found some rare plants. They also found some wetlands. Um, they were telling us, we're going to have all these jobs. And we said, well, how many locals are really going to be hired out of this? And it turned out when they're building a prison, they transfer people in from other areas. Yeah, they hire a few people. And yeah, there's some construction jobs with the, with the prison going on. But that was, that was about it. So um, they said, we're gonna, we can, we'll have public meetings. All right, we'll have public meetings. So what we did was we started phone banking. We called every single person in the phone book, um, and again, this was before internet, but we went through the phone book, and we each took pages of the phone book, called every single person, and said,
said, there's going to be a township meeting. We're going to have a meeting about this prison. We need you there. Um, and so um, we had a, a township hall. And I have to say, I was proud to be the one to call because the township hall held maybe 20 people. And I said, um, we have probably a 1,000 people committed to coming to this meeting. So um, they said, oh, no, oh, yes, we do. Let, we better move it. So they moved it to the high school. So they threw one other thing at us. They said, all right, anybody who's opposed, we can only have one spokesperson up on the stage to talk about their opposition, because you're representing all the people. And we thought, OK, how much more are they going to throw at us? So we did. I wasn't the spokesperson. So um, she got up before the group, and now it was overflow crowd. In the high school auditorium, people, every room, every seat was filled, the hallway was filled, people were out in the field in the back with speakers up there listening to this. And so she said, okay, how many people are asking for, how many people support this? Show by a clap of hands. And a few people clapped. And then she said, how many people oppose this? And there was a thunderous roar. Everybody was stomping their feet, shouting, clapping their hands. And her final word was, the gorilla is not going to sit here. And, um, and so the public engagement was the key. And so they had no other, you know, they, they could, it just kept going on and on for five minutes, you know, what's going to happen here. And so next thing we knew, uh, Department of Corrections um, packed up. And the prison was built in Pontiac. Mm -hmm. So um, they underestimated the power of our voice. And uh, we were pretty proud of that. So now I'm going to move to the UP. This is a hill climbing area where I live. It's um, heavy clay soil. And snowmobilers are going up and down this trail on, uh, all through the season. And the spring runoff causes sedimentation to grow into the Antonagin River, which is part of the Wild and Scenic River designation. And so, as a result, this is what was happening in the spring. And the trail is up in the upper corner where I have that blue mark. So that's where the snowmobile trail is. But they're riding, going off trail and going onto this hillside, and just causing all this damage. And uh, we had I went out there, I don't know how many times my husband and I went out there just documenting the damage being done, cedar trees being run over, other trees being run over, the runoff going into the river. Um, I raised it over a five-year period, so that's why I said never give up. The U.S. Forest Service, that trail actually goes through the Ottawa National Forest. They put up trail signs. They blew right through the signs. Uh, DEQ and DOT that oversees that hillside, they all will monitor the hillside. Yeah, right. You know, when are they going to be out there monitoring it? I went to the snowmobile club and said, look, you've got to do something here. They said, yeah, well, we wanted money. We tried to get money uh, in the past, but it was denied because there's no law that prohibits the hill climbing. So they're doing a legal act here, even though it's destroying it. Um, I kept trying to say it's the obligation of all agencies, the DNR, the DOT, the, Fish and, the U.S. Forest Service, to ensure that there's no resource damage. It kept falling on deaf ears, but I didn't give up. So then I had another idea, and I met with the Snowmobile Advisory Club. And so we drove over to that meeting, and I presented a slide presentation. And I cited a section of the law in the U.S. Forest Service code that says I could petition the Forest Service to close any trail due to resource damage. The U.S. Forest Service has the, the obligation to close any ATV trail, snowmobile trail, if it's causing, or any road even, for resource damage. And I just threw this at them. And I said, okay, you know, it's either your way or my way. We're going to do something about this. And so then they came up with $7,500, and they put a sign up and, uh, uh, saying that, uh, yeah, we have $7,500 of the funds to construct, uh, and they had a partial fence. They blew right past it. Well, 
then all of a sudden they came up with $11,000 and put up a fence across the trail. And there is now a fence across the trail. And now it's known locally as Nancy's Fence. But <laughs> <laughs> still, it's a fence. And it has virtually stopped all that trail riding. They finally got the message. I really didn't call for a chain link fence. I was kind of thinking just like some posts that they couldn't get through. But we have a fence there. So this is my other project. And this project took probably five years, I want to say, at least. And we had the Upper Peninsula Power Company and the Terra Land developer. And it's a willing seller and a willing buyer. And the Upper Peninsula Power Company planned to sell 7,300 acres of land. And these are all back lots. These are not waterfront property. Surrounding six flowages in the UP to the Natera land. And they were going to be chopped up, subdivided into a housing development. And that would be based on local zoning. And UPCO had a meeting. And they said, we contacted the DNR, we contacted the Forest Service, and no, uh, there was nobody who showed any serious interest in it. And it turned out that was a lie. And we were able to establish that was a lie. So this is really a story of the Upper Peninsula Power Company, Natera Land, county officials who supported this, township officials who supported it, and a school district who supported it, versus a small handful of people who refused to give up. And this is where it comes in saying, you want to be bigger, than, you want to appear to be bigger than you are. Because we formed this little group, and we were really only five people, uh, but they thought we were hundreds. And I have since come to know the person who was their PR person, uh, Janet Wolf, and she came up to me and told me the story that she was riding in her car when she got a call from a reporter asking about this group. And she was going, what group? She didn't know anything about this group. Um, there we were. We got involved with the media. And it was also a case of millions of dollars. We're talking millions of dollars. And we had a donation jar um, where, uh, and, and sold a couple of t-shirts, um, and, uh, and which is another whole little story there, too. The power company actually filed a case in our county because they couldn't believe we only spent 50 bucks. Um, but we did. It was phone calls, volunteering, never giving up. And um, they had, um, and this is all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. There were township and county officials, and UPCO and Natera execs met. But of course, unofficially. It was never before a township meeting that was open to the public. These were, oh, a barbecue, and it just so happens a county official was there. Oh, let's get together here for breakfast, and it just so happened to be the Natera executives there. And they were just promising everything. And again, UPCO threw everything at us they possibly could. They went through a 7.6 electric. Uh, price uh, electric rate increase. Oh, we're gonna, you know, we're not gonna give you a 7.6 price rate uh, increase in your uh, rates because you're gonna support our land development. Um, and they told them there was gonna be an increase in tax base without telling people the cost of services. Um, we're gonna have a bigger school. We're gonna be the savior for the school system. And of course, we're gonna do an environmentally friendly <coughs> development. I love that one. Especially when you look at the history of Natera and all the suits filed against them. I had to call them on that too. They said, oh yeah, environmentally friendly. Can you tell us what you did in the um, Iron County case where you blew out the, uh, um, the culverts there, and they said, oh, well, we, that was so minor, we didn't even have to report it. Oh, so unless you have a major thing, you don't even report it? How is that environmentally friendly? And of course, jobs. Jobs is a big thing. This is one of the flowages that uh, was planned for the development. And uh, by the time the UPCO Power Company held their first public meeting, 960 acres had already been sold, they had already proposed to move campgrounds at these areas, and they said, of course, to protect the resources. They had sold 250 acres at Cataract and 150 acres at Boney Falls, 
one of the other flowages. So over a thousand acres, twelve hundred acres of land were already sold by the time they had the first public meeting. And turned out they said no promises were made, that turned out to be a lie. And so Natera, on the Terra side, the land developer, they opened up offices all around the area to sell the land. They were going out there placing the survey sticks out. Um, they um, had plans to build a model home. And their model, which was appearing on the highways around, Heaven Has a Dock. And I'm going, Heaven Has a Dock? These are all back lots. These lots don't have waterfront property. And of course, at the meeting, people were left mumbling out, this is a done deal, what are we going to do about it? I said, we're going to fight like hell, we're not going to stop. This is bond flowage, uh, area view of a bond flowage, and this is how it looks today. Um, this is how it looked the day they sold the land. Um, and what happens, though, is each of these land, each of these um, flowages is protected by a license. And some of these licenses are called for old growth characteristics with no vegetative management, and there's a buffer zone. And just five years before the license was renewed, they never mentioned to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that oversees this license that they even plan to sell any land. And so the public never had the opportunity to comment on the sale of land. And so each of these license agreements are with the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And what happened is the, federal, the government says you can dam up your river, which is a public resource, but in exchange you're going to protect sensitive species. You're going to protect the habitat. You're going to preserve the natural undeveloped shoreline and allow unrestricted public access. And that buffer around these flowages is called the project lands. And each of these reservoirs had these project lands. And again, the land being sold was outside the project lands and don't have water access. But what they planned to do was, this is what their vision for bond flowage was. And the yellow is what's the project lands. And they plan to put docks along. Those little red spots are all the docks. And all those little squares are all the housing development that they were planning. And uh, this is an interesting story because this showed up on our doorstep one day. We have no idea to this day whoever dropped it off. So it does help when you're fighting a cause that you have a mole out there. <laughs> because we don't know who he was or she was. We just came home and found it in our door. And we're going, oh my gosh, who spilled the beans? Because once we got hold of this and we were able to put out, this is what they're planning to do to our lake, uh, people really got outraged. And so at some of the flowages, they were proposing corridors through the project lands, electric lifts, um, invasive removal of de woody debris, because they want to have it better for boating. Um, for this one, they were saying we're going to have access corridors through the project lands, leading to private docks with 10 slips, electric service, and storage for boats and docks on the project lands. And that is how we were able to win this case because these all were private uses and they're inconsistent with the license. So how did we do this? Public engagement. And I could go on to have an hour just on what we did on this. I mean, but one funny story was they had a public meeting and when there's a public meeting, uh, we created a mock dock of how long the dock would be, lit it with the 400 watts that they said was going to be allowed. And we had a mock dock at the school. And that really ticked off up color. They said, oh, you are mis, uh, misrepresenting the facts because the light is bouncing off all the, uh, all the, uh, the lockers in the room. And I said, I'm misrepresenting the facts? How about if you put your dock, and let's see how your dock is different than our dock. Well, it turned out the newspaper happened to, 
it was a very good visual, and it appeared on the front page of the newspaper, this is what they're doing. Um, that really helped us a lot. So we had to research the license. I don't know how many hours we each were taking different licenses. And, I mean, we're talking a license that's an inch thick. Um, we partnered with other agencies. The U.S. Forest Service was critical. DNR was critical. Other non-government organizations like UPEP. Um, we petitioned the FERC and we went around and got signatures from people saying we want a shoreline management plan because it says in the license they will have to do one. Um, we did letter writing campaigns and yes, I ghost wrote many, many letters. I'd go to people and say, why are you opposed to it? And I'd write down their notes and I'd go home and I'd type up a letter for them and, to sign in. Um, engage the media. We got hold of the media. That's another story. Somebody came to Bond. We met, I met a reporter at Bond and uh, we were doing an interview there and just then somebody pulled up and said, oh, what's going on? And we said, oh yeah, you know, well, up coast planning, a, a, the terrace planning a development here. There's going to be houses here. And he goes, oh gee, we, we're planning to uh, dump my dad's ashes. That's why we're all here, because this was one of his favorite places. Poof! Instant story! Heartstrings! You know, uh, poor man died and his ashes are going to be dumped in the river, in the lake, and now it's going to be surrounded by houses. Oh, and that, that played really good. Uh, uh, but we attended, I don't know how many township meetings, county meetings. It took a lot of time. But within a month of the sale, the sale took place in December, FERC demanded um, information from UPCO and said, wait a minute, what's all this that you're doing? Uh, you know, we better put the skids on this. And the terrorists going, whoa, what, what, what do you mean? We already bought this property. We're paying taxes on it. And the FERC came out and said, yeah, you need to do a shoreline management plan. And it's subject to public comment. And we have to approve it. And everybody's going like, oh my god, oh now what are we going to do? And we're going, yes, finally, okay. So we put the skids on it. It wasn't a done, we didn't win, but we put the skids on it. And meanwhile, Natera's plans were all put on hold. Because they couldn't put us, they couldn't even begin to build a house because they wanted to give these people water access. And so if you're buying a piece of property, you want to know if you're buying the back lots with all the mosquitoes or if you're going to have the access to the water in a private dock. So they couldn't do anything except pay the taxes. And <laughs> weeks turned months to years. And we're going, okay, Natera lost its patience and some in Natera lost their jobs. Uh, some in UPCO lost their jobs, um, and we learned about that when all of a sudden you did a Google on them and found, oh, you know, he's got a resume up here? Hmm, okay. And we found the guy who was their lead real estate person working in Milwaukee with a hard hat. Um, anyway, so then, uh, fast forward a little bit longer, and I get a phone call from a reporter who says, what can you tell me about the lawsuit? And I go, what lawsuit? And it turns out, Natera Land files a lawsuit against UPCO. And he couldn't access the lawsuit. Well, I got on my computer and I, we found the lawsuit. And it turned out that, yep, Natera filed a lawsuit for breach of contract because UPCO failed deliver, to deliver on the promises made for water access. So in the back room deals, UPCO promised Natera water access, and now everything fell apart. And so, as part of the settlement agreement for the lawsuit, UPCO had to buy back all the land from the Terra uh, for an undisclosed price. We never did find out how much they had to pay for it. Uh, Natera closed down all the offices, pulled up the stakes, and they left the area. Mm. And today, there are no private docks or any private uses on any of the flowages. And we're going, whoa, that's exactly, now, who's to say, you know, tomorrow, UPCO doesn't decide to sell the land again, or any of that stuff can happen all over again, but they know we're watching. And they know we're going to keep them 
to adhere to that license, which is in existence for now, what, for another 10 more years, probably? So, now we're going to shift to the wolf hunt, another issue that I've been involved in. And um, where we live in the UP, yes, we're home to wolves. And most of these pictures, this is a wolf uh, that was taken, a picture on our trail cam just north of our house. And I'm going to go through some of this stuff here. And it started with legislation. And we found out that FOIA, Freedom of Information Requests, are a powerful tool. And when the legislation was being proposed, um, we were able to get copies of all the correspondence that was going on. And buried in there was an email from Russ Mason, who was the DNR Wildlife Chief, sending it to his legislative liaison who said, uh, the legislation looks good, but I think scientific management might, we might want a different term because the science will be debatable. Uh, would it be better to use a term like professional or such? So he wanted the language changed. This is another one of our wolves, female wolf. So we had Public Act 520 signed into law in the final days of the legislative session of 2012. And that legislation designated the wolf as a game animal and authorized a hunting season. And the final law came out saying the sound management of wolf populations, dot, dot, dot. And we said, where's the science? Scientific was removed from the bill. So we don't have to use science to uh, manage a wolf population. Just take the science out. So um, there was a method to their madness by signing the legislation at the very end of the legislative session. Michigan law says you only have a certain number of days, something like 90 days, um, from the end of the legislative session if the public is going to appeal any decision by the veto referendum. So they suspected that we were going to be filing a petition uh, against this legislation, and uh, so they wait till the last day. Now, this is also the week between Christmas and New Year's, um, and so in order to even get the ballot, we had to get the language approved by the Secretary of State. And so everybody dragged their feet, and we're going, we need this approval. We finally got that approval the end of January, which gave us 60 days to collect 256,000 signatures. And we did it. 256,000 signatures across the state. I represented the UP and our regional coordinator getting signatures in the UP. But we got signatures from every county in the state. And we presented that, um, and that suspended that law. But that didn't stop the legislature, because as soon as they thought we were going to have the signatures, when it looked like we were going to get it, they didn't think we were going to do it, and we did, they passed another law. They passed Public Act 21, which rendered the referendum meaningless. So we have another law in the books. And this, is, um, this picture was just taken a couple of weeks ago on uh, our trail camp. And so Public Act 21 allowed the hunt to take place. There was no trapping. Um, we killed 22 wolves during the hunt. 11 were still killed during that year in control actions. And we still had 14 that were killed illegally that year. And so the DNR built this as we need this wolf hunt to control conflict. Uh, and people will support that. I will support that. We need to kill a wolf because wolves are killing a farmer's uh, cows. People will accept it has to be killed. Uh, if a wolf is killing a neighbor's dog, yeah, I, I could accept the fact that we may have to kill a wolf because of it. So they came out and said, we need to kill wolves because of conflict. So where were the wolves killed? These were two wolves killed outside the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. We had a wolf killed in the Sturgeon River Gorge. We had wolves killed at the Black River Falls area. And we had wolves killed at Prickett. 
And um, mm -hmm. I don't see any cows there. I don't see any houses there. Um, and so uh, one was killed within five miles of a farm that last had a depredation. Okay, that sounds like it might be a good reason. In 2011, four years before the hunt, three years before the hunt, three were killed five miles from a farm that last had a depredation in 2012. So DNR pulled out their statistics and went three years prior to the hunt and said, okay, we've had depredations here, wolves killing livestock here, 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 and here. They it totally ignored the fact that nothing had happened in the two years prior. Um, so we still gathered signatures uh, to challenge Public Act 21 and we collected another 230,000 signatures, again, every county. Um, and they both appeared on the ballot in November of 2014. And this was really difficult because both laws had to be rejected by voters. If they weren't rejected, the other one becomes effective. So we had the first one, we had the second one, and one or the other could become effective. So I was up all night watching returns. Um, and we still had people, groups, there were different groups um, that were coming out saying, but if one passes and the other doesn't, can we still have a wolf hunting and trapping season? <laughs> so they were still doing it. But as I said, I was up till 2 o'clock in the morning, even when it looked like we were winning. Um, I still couldn't believe it, so I still stayed up longer. I watched all the returns come in. Voters said no to both. Uh, they said they didn't want a wolf hunt, and they didn't want the NRC designating species as game. And we thought, yes, people came out, we got it. <sighs> okay, so we're going to go to the wolf management plan here, because the wolf management plan, how did we even accomplish this? The wolf management plan specifically says public education could help foster a realistic understanding of the positive and negative consequences associated with wolf levels. And we have to have public perceptions, actual public perceptions of human safety posed by wolves. You know, if I've got a wolf next door that's, you know, could be a public safety, yeah, I think we might need to do something about it. But we had Michigan DNR officials says um, that, uh, we have to have this wolf hunt because Michigan wolves, we have a, there's an Ironwood residence, that's way western UP, that was pounding on a sliding glass door at wolves that showed no fear. And, uh, wait a minute, if that had happened, that would have been front page of the newspapers. I live here. Uh, so I asked for a FOIA request. And it turned out it never happened. And um, he had to go on the radio and, and say, oh, I misspoke. That came from a book I read about cougars. <laughs> oh, it wasn't really long. But they waited. And then he even he did a bit. He said, I didn't realize I misspoke until he got a FOIA request. Oh. And even then, he didn't come out. And I'm going, wait a minute. I sent that FOIA request right away. When you got the FOIA request and you knew that you did something wrong, why didn't you go on the radio right away? That's what a respectable person would do. No, he waited until I took that information to a reporter, and the reporter called him and had to go on the radio and apologize. Um, and then we have our state senator, Tom Casperson, who made up a fictitious story about wolves in a daycare center. And that never happened, and um, DNR never rebutted the story either when the <coughs> senator came out with it. And um, again, we went to him with the facts. So the reporter went to him for facts and said, well, if you found out that this stuff wasn't true, would you apologize before the Senate? And he says, of course I'd apologize. Well, here are the facts. And again, through FOIA, um, and gave him the facts, and uh, so he had to go on the Senate floor and apologize for giving wrong information. Uh, and so um, we also exposed the actual depredation data that, yeah, wolves were going out 
out there killing cattle all over the place. There were a few farms that were having a problem, but there's one farm in particular that had most of the, de the depredation. But that didn't deter the Senate, the uh, legislature, because even though voters said no to two laws, they passed a third law, and this was called the Scientific Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. And it didn't require the governor's signature, and it didn't go um, to the voters. Um, it is supported by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Safari Club International, a few other groups. It's a mirror image of the bill that the people said no to, um, except it put an appropriation in there. And if you have an appropriation in a bill, then the public is not allowed to challenge it through the referendum process. And uh, what they also did was they sweetened the pot to get people to sign for their signature by saying, we're going to give licenses to the military personnel for free. How does that sound? You wrap yourself around the American flag and, you know, but they never told them it was going to be about a wolf hunt. It, they just said, you know, well, free licenses for honey, for military, and never told them either the military only pay a dollar for their license. And by only paying the dollar, that qualifies for Pitt and Robinson funds because uh, the state gets kickbacks based on the number of licenses they sell. And so for a dollar license, you get federal funding. Uh, but they didn't tell them that. And so the only option was to take them to court, went to court, and the, that law, law number three, was ruled unconstitutional because they didn't tell people it was about a wolf hunt. They muddled the whole thing about this um, law, uh, and so we won on the constitutional level, but it didn't deter. Um, on December of 2016, a fourth law was enacted, and they put an appropriation in it to prevent another vote by the people. So where we stand now, once wolves are federally delisted, Michigan has the authority to implement a wolf hunting and tracking season against the will of the people. So we haven't won this battle yet. The story is still being written. And um, wolves were federally delisted in 2012. But that was overturned by the court in 2014. We have a lot of zigzagging here. So for the period, though, just to put it in perspective, in the Great Lakes region, because this will be in the news a lot, between January 2012 and December of 2014, in the Great Lakes region, 1,400, over 1,400 wolves were killed either by hunting or trapping. Most of those were in Minnesota. Michigan lost 22. The rest were in Minnesota and then next followed by Wisconsin. And over 900 were killed in patrol actions. That's where the state could go in and kill the wolf responsible for depredation. And so um, there was an appeal filed against the delisting rule or the protection to protect them. Um, and that was denied. So currently, as of today, Wolves are still federally protected as endangered in Michigan and Wisconsin and federally threatened in Minnesota. So that story, we still don't know where, where it's going to go. And we anticipate this is what's going to come down the pipe. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services is proposing to delist wolves in the Great Lakes region, or they may be putting forth a delisting for the entire country. Um, They've lost in court by just picking distinct populations like the Great Lakes region. So we're anticipating they may say wolves will be delisted nationwide. And there's also a possibility that wolves can be delisted through congressional action, where they tend to stick a rider on attached to a must-pass bill that would call for delisting. We have stopped this now for years, every time they've done it, through letters, visits to representative senators going, drop that bill, you know, drop that rider. Um, and we're not giving up. And, you know, they say, well, where's the common ground? What's the compromise? And we have, I've been part of groups like the Humane Society, actually form, uh, file a formal petition with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services to reclassify wolves as threatened throughout the entire U.S., except the Mexican and the red wolf, which would still be endangered. And we're saying, let's just 
Threatened status means the states can kill wolves that are a problem, but we aren't going to have a hunting season. So it's a compromise. And I think it's a realistic one. We'll see if, where that goes. And also, uh, this is by the Center for Biological Diversity, who proposed a nationwide wolf recovery plan, which would promote recovery in areas like the Southern Rockies, the Dakotas, the Adirondacks, where there's suitable wolf habitat, but no wolves. So we think there's a lot of negotiating here. We'll just see where we go. So for more than 50 years, I have been advocating for wildlife, for the environment, for wild spaces. I think the number one thing, though, is transparency. We need science-based decisions, not political decisions. And that's getting tougher and tougher. So, but what you need to do is find your passion. I don't care what your passion is. Your passion might be rivers, streams, plants, flowers. It doesn't matter. Um, and wildlife, elephants, whatever it is. You know, uh, I mean, elephants are in dire need too because they're being killed for their ivory. Um, you know, water, fish, bears, doesn't matter. Anything to find your passion. Get inspired by listening to a child. You know, and you're going, what am I going to learn by, from a child? This just happened to me last week. Two weeks ago, I got a phone call, and then this, this particular thing happened. My niece's daughter, so my great niece, called me and said, Aunt Nancy, I'm working on a project. She's in the third grade. Mm -hmm. And the project is, what can, I, what can I do to change the world? And she wanted to know what I was doing to save wildlife. And after I gave the conversation with her, she said, would you talk to my teacher? And I did, and so I had a Skype training session with third graders. <laughs> and it was PS 372, Brooklyn, New York, on what I can do to change the world. And I was so inspired by these kids. I mean, just their knowledge, they were little sponges, asking me all the questions. I found out that this, this is an actual picture of their school. This is the little piece of land that their school sits on. And they have a garden. They have a community garden. Um, they plant flowers for the birds and the bees. Um, they have food to eat. Um, and I'm going, they have a patch of land that's smaller than this area that I'm standing in. And yet they're trying to do something to change the environment. Some of the projects they're working on Saving monarch butterflies. And they told me all about what they're doing, uh, planting milkweed. And uh, one of the little girls talked about how she found an injured monarch butterfly and took it to be rehabilitated. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. But she did, and she released it. The butterfly can't fly. Um, so she took it to this little preserve, and in her mind, this butterfly is going to live happily ever after. Um, and I thought, okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, climate change. I was asked the question, what did I think about climate change? And did I really think that New York would be flooded? And he wanted to know if I see any floods where I am. And he wanted to know what changes I saw in Michigan due to climate change. This is a third grader asking me this question. She stands up and reads a little piece of paper. Um, another one wanted to save habitat for animals and wanted to know because he was really concerned about trees that were being cut down. And that's habitat. And I had to try to explain, too, that, yeah, trees get cut down. But sometimes it's OK because trees, when they are cut down, they provide habitat for other animals if they're left in brush piles. And uh, wanted to know how, what he can do to stop poaching. And poaching, okay. Um, and I mean, these are things that I was not prepared for. I had no idea they were gonna ask me these questions. And I told them that we need strict laws about wildlife laws. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to stop poaching. And how he needs to write 
to his state legislators and find out who his legislators are. So as part of his action plan, he was going to find out who his legislators were, and he was going to write to them because he wants to stop poaching. And I thought, third grade, wow. I, I got done with this interview with these kids, and I'm going, they inspired me. I, I don't know, I'm going, that's what we need. And so the question comes down is, what's going to be your legacy? We live on 280 acres, and one of the things we did was restore this wetland. And, uh, and it's just amazing to see the transformation. Um, a botanist found a plant growing in one of our ponds that was not discovered anywhere in the county. And it turned out, and I said, well, where did it come from then? And it turned out that 100 years ago or more, this area was a wetland that was drained for agricultural purposes. And then when we restored it as a wetland, those seeds that had been dormant in the ground for 100 years or more, however long it was, all of a sudden grew back. So add water, and this is what you get. <laughs> you know, no, no. We restored the wetland. We have our land set up in, um, in zones. Of the 280 acres that we have, only three acres can be built upon. Um, and we manage it for wildlife habitat, and we place the conservation easement on it. And so our river corridor, we have about a half a mile of river frontage, and that river corridor has the tightest protection. Uh, we protected it as if it was a wild and scenic river with the most uh, stringent uh, recommendations on there. So there's <coughs> never going to be a dock on our river. There's never going to be more than just some footpaths along the river corridor. It'll never be logged along the river corridor. And then we have our northern part uh, where I showed you that picture of that first wolf. That's going to be managed for old growth forest. We're going to have the wetland area. So we have all these different areas of our land. Um, we have, um, this past year, we did some wildlife cuttings, uh, one acre parcels, within uh, 10 one acre parcels around the property that would encourage growth and open up the area and protect for wildlife. Um, and within a few days of that, uh, we had the deer going in there, which brought in some wolves, and we had wolves sleeping in our field. And then we placed all our property under a conservation easement forever. So there will never be a cell tower on this property. It will never have any kind of development on the property. And so you need to make your voice heard. Um, demand transparency. FOIA is a powerful tool. And with FOIA, be prepared for <coughs> delays. Um, each government agency is bound by a time frame to respond by such and such a date. On the day of you're supposed to get your response, you'll get something that says, uh, we need a 30-day um, extension. And then on the 30-day extension, then they'll ask for money. And then, so by the time you get the stuff, sometimes it's six months old. Well, not quite six months, but three months. Um, I actually had to file a lawsuit against the Michigan DNR on the DNR, and I won. But that's another side issue. But FOIA is a powerful tool. At every, every government level, you can have FOIA. At the county level, at the state level, at the federal level. Know how your representative votes on issues. And make sure your representatives know you're watching them. Thank them when they do vote the way you want and let them know you saw how they voted and you're disappointed in your vote. So on issues that matter to you, know what's happening. Contact your representatives. I have them in my email, you know, just fire off a message. Letters to the editor are powerful. We found that everybody reads letters to the editor. Organize events. It doesn't have to be a real big event. It doesn't have to be a big formal event like this. Sometimes, just the table at a meeting. Um, we went to an UPCO meeting and we were banned from being in the meeting because it was a private meeting. And so um, we weren't paying for the room, so UPCO was allowed to be in the room by themselves. 
And so we stood, so we asked the hotel, hey, could we set up our stuff outside? And we said, sure. So we set up our stuff outside, and it was snow flurries. And the first people who showed up was the press that the power oh. company had invited. And they said, what are you ladies doing out here? We said, Upco would let us in their meeting. Oh. And that became the lead story. So it was like, okay, our red noses, eyes running because we were so cold because we were planning to be inside. Lead story, TV6 news recording. Yeah, Upco would. So they got our story first. And we're going, we just lucked out, you know? Anyway. Social network, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, that word gets out. <clears throat> and never underestimate the power of your voice. Because if you never doubt, this is my favorite quote by Margaret Hughes, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. With that, I think we have about five minutes for questions. If anybody has a question. Farmer for six missing livestock 
in Michigan, we have a law, thank you legislators, that says um, if a farm has ever had depredation any time in the past, 10, 15 years ago, and now you have missing livestock, all you have to do is get a notarized statement that says, I had missing livestock and wolves did it. And you get paid. Mm. And that was our biggest expense last year. Another question. How stable is the wolf population? Uh, it's, it's stable. Um, it's not growing out of, it's about 682 animals, up from 13, 20 some odd years ago. It fluctuates between 638 to 682, and we're right at 660. Uh, wolves, um, the wolf population is dependent on the prey base, and the, and the prey base is based on the weather. But wolves will self-regulate. So uh, if there's not enough, Food to eat, the wolves will die. Oh, I see the uh, documentary as Koi Wolf. Is, is that uh, an issue in the UK? It's not an issue in, in the UK. Uh, wolves genetically can mate with a coyote, but more than likely they're going to kill that coyote rather than mate with it. Um, and same thing with the dog. They can genetically mate with a dog, but they're going to kill it. So no, it, it's not a problem. The DNA that they've done research on goes back like hundreds and hundreds of years ago, hundred years ago, but not here. But I think we're ready to move on for break. I don't want to stop anybody from break. We've I'll be hanging around. We've got that? a couple more minutes. A couple know. minutes? Okay, time for one more. A couple of years ago, on the internet, there was this video. Oh, thank you. A few years ago, on the internet, there was a video about wolves circulating, and it was wonderfully well done. And what it was telling us that when wolves were removed from the landscape, that the landscape suffered. The water and exactly. the mm -hmm. vegetation all disappeared, in essence. They returned the wolves, and it all came back. Right, is that a fact? It that, is a fact. I know the video you're referring to, it's called How the Bulls Saved Rivers or something to that effect. And it oversimplifies it. Um, it does oversimplify it. But there is tons and tons of research on the trophic cascade when you put a predator on the landscape. Right now, CWD is the big problem. And ironically, CWD is in areas where there are no wolves, or very few wolves. And so wolves have the, uh, the capability of slowing the spread of CWD. Another disease is the uh, bovine tuberculosis. Another problem is um, EHD, which is a virus. And what happens is just uh, the way I explain it to kids. If you're in the playground and you're playing tag, who are you going to get? You're going to get the kid who stumbles, you're going to get the kid who falls, you're going to get the slowest kid, you're going to get the kid who makes a mistake and goes the wrong way. Those are the ones the wolves are going to get. And so you have a wolf that has a disease like chronic wasting or one of the other diseases I mentioned. That, wolf, that deer is not going to be able to run as fast. It's not going to be able to, it's not thinking correctly. Um, it's in survival mode, and those are the ones the wolves are going to take. And so, yeah, it makes a big difference. Uh, another area is when you have another research project was we had deer, the same number of deer in two areas, two study areas. The difference was there were no wolves in one area. And the areas where they don't have the wolves, the deer ate the vegetation down to nothing. All the plant life was gone. All the um, native plants, the trillions, and all these other plants, all gone because those are the favorite foods of the deer. So you have an area of, I always went to, well, I've got a picture right here, but it's not on my computer. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the landscape has just, just been trampled down by deer. Well, if you're a brown density bird, it's going to be pretty tough to raise a clutch of uh, birds in that environment. You're going to have hawks and eagles and everything else going after it. But in areas where there is a wolf population, the deer are kept moving. And so those areas all grow. So yeah, trophic cascade is real. It does happen. And top predators, it's a top-down process. So with that. That's good science. Yes. Yeah. So with that.
science, not politics. And I'll be hanging around here yet for a little while anyway. At least a lot. All right.